thank you for having me. So I want to kick this off by sharing a little story about myself. So I grew up a dreamer, and that's saying a lot because I'm only 17 years old and I'm a high school student. But I spent a lot of time looking at how I could support other youth my age. More specifically, how I could work with them to come up with solutions to problems that they're passionate about, very similar to I did at the ripe old age of five or six years old. But part of that is reaching out to thousands and thousands of students across the world and forming a support system that I hope that I had at a young age as well. But I want to share two specific stories. One on the left from a student named Liam, who created a very compact spacesuit, which helps to prevent radiation in space. And the other one on the right, which is a self-writing pencil by a girl named Rosie, both of whom live in Wyoming in the United States and are only in sixth grade. Now, these are just two ideas of thousands and thousands across the world. So far, I've spoken with 70,000 students across 43 countries, six continents, and still counting. But something that I've learned is that each and every single one of these students have new ideas, new ways of thinking, and new passions that they want to bring to reality. Now, years ago, I was one of these students who also wanted to come up with new ideas and root all of my passions in scientific knowledge and research. And so I wanted to give back to my community. So each of these students now have 70,000 new budding ideas that we can foster and we can encourage around the world. But to share a little bit about myself, my name is Githanjali Rao. I'm 17 years old. I'm an author, I'm a STEM promoter, but before all of that, I'm a student. I'm a learner, I'm someone who's curious, and I'm someone who's willing to constantly keep up with the world around me. Now, as a high school student, I've learned a lot about the world, but the biggest thing is recognizing what the future really means. I've realized the potential of technology, and more importantly, why we should take advantage of technological solutions out there to build newer and creative solutions. Now, I want to share a few technology that I'm sure all of you have heard about, but ones that are always worth sharing. I want to start with 5G. A 20 gig per sec 5G speed can offer almost real-time interaction with almost no lag. Surgeries can be performed remote, people can be in video conferences as holograms, and so much more. And something that seems so far away is slowly becoming a reality every single day as 5G is already on most of our phones. Now, second, nanosciences. Viruses that we gain are actually 5 to 10 nanometers long. And with the implementation of new nanoparticles, we're able to create filters and vaccines and pills that are even shorter in length so that we're able to prevent these viruses from ever entering our bodies. Over the summer, which I'll talk about later as well, I've had the incredible opportunity to work at the Koch Institute of Integrated Cancer Research in Cambridge, Massachusetts, to look specifically at how nanoparticles can attack lung tumors for targeted drug delivery. Now, another one here is genetic engineering and gene editing. All these viruses that were once incurable because they were completely gene-borne are now turning into ones that can be cured. For example, cystic fibrosis now has working cures that are able to get rid of the disease before it even enters a child's body, just to be able to remove an area of the DNA that has a genetic mutation and replace it with a new one. Augmented reality and virtual reality. The combination of using things that already exist and mixing them with new and learned data is something that's improving our world for the better, far beyond just Pokemon Go. And last but not least, one that's been taking the world by storm, artificial intelligence. Now, whether that's generative AI or simple AIs that we already find online, we're seeing new and new ways for robots and machines that think and behave just like human beings. Now, imagine decisions that are made by you and me that can soon be made by robots in the next few years. Recognizing all of that, the reason I'd like to spend so much time on this slide is because this quite literally is our future. But more importantly, all of these technologies without a real application are just long words. So it's important to not fear the future, but instead take advantage of some of these technologies that we see on a daily basis and improve upon them, learn on them so that we can continue growing as a society. And more importantly, grow up with the world around us, because I personally have seen some of these technologies grow as well. But looking at all of this, I want to talk a little bit about my journey, how I harness some of this technology to build my own solutions. 
So my journey of innovation started at the age of six years old, where I was coming up with all sorts of ideas that I had never seen before and putting things together in a new and novel way. So on the top left corner, I created a tool called Asclepius, which helps to diagnose for snake bites using non-contact thermography technology. It's able to measure the severity of a bite, if it's venomous or not, and most importantly, what type of venom is injected into your body just based on heat signatures. Secondly, on the bottom left corner, I created a tool called Pollen Screen, which is a method to be able to or repel and attract pollen ions using electrostatic ions. Each pollen, basically, that you see out there in the world or can't see because it's microscopic, is charged either positively or negatively. And by creating some sort of charged surface, you're able to directly attract it or directly repel it so that it never enters your nose. In the middle, I had a little bit of an airplane phase. I looked to create a black box detector tool using underwater laser communication so that you're able to remotely log into an airplane black box and pull out information. I also created a tool called Laser Screen, which uses rubidium atoms bound together to absorb laser light when they're shined into airplane windshields to, with the intention of blinding a pilot. And on the right side was a very elementary version of one of the tools that I'll talk about later that helps to detect and prevent cyberbullying using artificial intelligence and machine learning. But the one I'm most known for is my device called Tethys, which helps to detect for lead in drinking water faster and cheaper than current methods out there today. It uses carbon nanotube sensor technology, and it sends all the data to your mobile phone on an application that I created and allows you to upload the results, the location, and the time of your test so you can see a heat map of locations with more lead levels and less lead levels accordingly. The device itself is a patented device, and I'm working with mass manufacturers for skill testing and to put the device out there for field testing in places like Flint, Michigan in the US, which was my original inspiration for coming up with a device like this. I've also created a tool called Epione that's able to diagnose for prescription opioid addiction at an early stage. So Epione itself uses protein detection methods as well as genetic engineering to be able to take a picture of a pre-prepared bodily fluid sample, cut it down to the region of interest, and compare it with an AI-generated set of results so that you're able to see a directional result of how addicted you are. The goal is this is something that physicians can use to be able to do a screening before patients are prescribed a new medication or for rehabilitation centers to kind of measure that progress of coming down from an addiction as well. So this is currently at a prototype stage, but once testing is completed, Epione is meant to be the first ever clinical tool to diagnose for opioid addiction. Now, I've created a tool in partnership with UNICEF as a digital public good called Kindly, which is an artificial intelligence service that uses machine learning and specifically natural language understanding and processing to identify words or phrases that may be considered cyberbullying. So the interesting thing about Kindly is that all of its data is completely crowdsourced. On the Kindly landing page, anyone can go in and add their own words and phrases to train the artificial intelligence engine. And just like spell check works, where you typically wouldn't send an email with grammar er errors in it, Kindly does the same exact thing, which is a non-punitive approach towards cyberbullying. It's leveraged on research that I read that says it only takes seven seconds for a teenager to want to unsend something that they sent. So similar to spell check, it makes you aware of what you're sending, but doesn't stop you from sending anything at all. So that's the goal of Kindly. Right now, it's actually available as an API or a block of code that anyone can add into their own front ends to add a cyberbullying filter capability. But in the next few months, it'll be available as a Google Chrome extension with Slack and Discord integration. And a few months after that, it should be available on Snapchat, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and other social media that we know and love as a toggle filter. In the past summer, I had the opportunity to work in Boston to do my own personal research as well. So along with the lab, I focus on lung tumor drug delivery, and so looking at the biocirculation of specific drugs and how we can get it to attack lung tumors. And in addition to that, coming up with new gene sequencing technology, which means that vaccines that took us about nine to 10 months to create can now be created in three to four months once research is complete. But on top of that, when I'll stop talking about myself here, the biggest question I get is how do I do this, right? And where do you start, especially as a teenager? So I wanna share a concept that I'm sure all of you are familiar with, which is design thinking. 
Something as simple as design thinking can have a lot of different takes to it, a lot of different ways in which we can interpret it. Well, I want to start out with the most important part of design thinking, which roots at an empathy and human focus. So the way that I view design thinking will slowly move into my process, which I'll share next as well. But everything should be rooted at this idea of impact. How do we come up with solutions that impact the community at large? And secondly, what that moves into is the divergence and convergence of choices. So ideas that initially you would start at a very specific point and work outwards towards should start at a very broad idea and then become more specific. And how that works is through the process of analysis and synthesis. What we used to look at before is taking a very broad set of ideas and breaking them down to pieces that are more attackable and more feasible to be able to solve. But through the process of synthesis and putting things together and not expecting perfection on the first try, we're able to see more of that convergence, right? We're able to see more broader solutions and more broader solution points just by putting new ideas together and bringing new solutions to life. And what that leads to is this prototyping, development of iterative solutions that are meant to be done again and again and again. Again, without expecting per perfection the first time around. Failure and iteration is such a crucial step of the process when it comes to design thinking. And lastly, what that means is consumption to participatory systems, right? We're seeing this outdated concept of the customer is always right. It needs to be more of this, I guess, communication between both the consumer and the producer as to how to create the best product possible. But what this all means is that design thinking in the past was very specific. It came to Bluetooth connections and beveled edges and organic designs. But it, what it truly should move into is the importance of using design thinking to solve big problems in our community. Something that was just a concept should be used to tack the, tackle these big problems. What we originally recognize as the scientific thinking process or the engineering design process should slowly give way to design thinking and how it should be utilized. So I took this concept of design thinking, created my own process that I share with teenagers across the world. And what that is, is my five-step process towards innovation. And that's observe, brainstorm, research, build, and communicate. And regardless of how elementary this sounds as well, it's not as straightforward as it looks. And these errors are all randomly placed for a reason because this process is a guide. It's not a prescriptive process towards innovation, but it breaks down the process of innovation into five main steps. And it normalizes failure. First being observe, identify a problem in your community that you're passionate about. Secondly, brainstorm, come up with a list of solutions. And I always like to tell these students there's quantity over quality, and that's what's always important, right? It's always important to come up with as many solutions as possible, because the second you start narrowing down, then you're limiting your brain's potential. Third, research. Now, this is the time to narrow down that list of solutions into one or two main ones that you've decided to focus on. Build these solutions, bring them to life, and the most important and underrated step, communicate them. Bring them to the playing field, get feedback on your ideas, ask questions on ways to improve it. Now, this works for innovation, this works for problem solving, but it also works for so many other applications, making decisions in the real world, right? Leadership qualities and attributes. All of this roots at this five-step process with the biggest and important factor being iteration and risk-taking and failure. This process isn't meant to happen just in one time. You see that arrow from the end all the way to the beginning? That's what should happen, right? Keep making mistakes, keep trying things again, and work through this process as a guide, not a prescriptive process. But from there, when I come up with this process, when I share it with a lot of teenagers across the world, many of them bring their ideas to life. Many of them have ideas that they want to put out there, but they don't see that support that I had to be able to accurately represent these ideas and bring them out to the real world and finish that communication stage that should be important in the part of the process. So I want to share these three big pillars of innovation that are important to me as a student, and that should be important to all of you to harness the ingenuity of youth. So first and foremost, awareness. Bringing awareness to the problems that you're facing. When I work with students, I always tell them to always post about ideas, leverage the power of social media to your own advantage. But at the same end, if you work for an organization or a company, use social media to reach out to students and look at the new and novel ideas that they're creating as well. 
Secondly, mentorship. If I had to create one request to all of you, it would be to seek a mentee and mentor them in the areas that they are passionate about. I wouldn't be up on the stage today if it weren't for my mentors across the way who believed in me when no one else did. And last but not least, internships and research. Opening up opportunities for teenagers and youth to bring their ideas to life and to spread them out there. And straying away from this normal stereotype of internships being just making coffee and copies, but instead bringing real world problems and real world solutions to the playing field, a new perspective that youth can bring as well. And so I wanna tie this all back with some of the experiences that I've had. For me specifically, I had the chance to work with the Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya for the past year and a half. And each and every one of these students who sometimes didn't even know what innovation meant, didn't know how to use a computer, were able to come up with a new idea. And that to me is the power of innovation. So I request all of you to take that time to say yes. If a student has a question for you, take them up on it. If a student wants to just visit your lab, visit your office, if a student wants to have a 10 minute Zoom call with you, take that time to say yes. Your power means so much more. I always like to tell people that the moment I figured out what I wanted to do in life was when I walked into a lab when I was 11 years old for the first time and realized that that was kind of my dream one day. And I hope every student gets that opportunity, but we can't do it alone. It requires the support of adults and it requires that fostering and it requires that help and guidance. And I hope to really put that message out there to each and every single one of you to take that opportunity to say yes. But once again, if you didn't take away anything from today's conversation, I wanna share my five key takeaways. First and foremost, be a risk taker. Never stop risk taking. Failure is just another step to success. A teacher told me once that fail stands for first attempt in learning and I stick with that on a daily basis. Secondly, innovation can't work on a deadline. The second you put a deadline on creativity, it makes it very difficult to think in a unique manner and to not constrict yourself with a box around your head. Third, empathy and impact drives the best solution, so never lose touch of that as well. Fourth, persist and stay longer with the problem. Perseverance and determination is two of my key factors that keep me going every single day. And last but not least, I feel like I've stressed this one enough, find mentors, be one, be a great role model for people who need it the most. So, to end this off, I wanna share a quote paraphrased by my favorite scientist, Marie Curie. She says that nothing in life is to be feared, it is only to be understood. And I think that's why we're all here today, to fear less and to understand more. So I hope that I've shared with you my message today and I've hoped that I've empowered all of you to help recognize and alleviate problems in our community and help to find ways to solve them and help to support the youth that do as well. So thank you for your time. I wanna share my book as well, A Young Innovator's Guide to STEM. Thank you.